Hey folks, hey IO Psych, it is wonderful to see you right now. Um, so I want to spend a little bit of time talking about how we're going to do these lectures from now on. Now I could sit here and go through all 60 of these slides in one shot, but I have a feeling that given that I don't really know what your schedules are going to be like or um, when you're going to have access to a computer or things like that, I figured it was a better uh, opportunity to kind of do these in 20 minute slices. So that way you don't have to watch them all at once. You can pick and choose as you go and you can watch them throughout the week. Um, so by the way, I would also uh, like to introduce you to your teaching assistant. This is Earl, um, and he will be happy to sit on my lap as I give you this discussion uh, about employee motivation today. So let's go ahead and full screen this, and we will go ahead and get started. Woohoo! There we are. Um, here is your TA. <laughs> he's happy to be here, and he's very soft and fluffy. So, we're going to start by talking about employee motivation. Normally, um, after spring break, this is the kind of time where I'd crack a joke about, well, you don't have a lot of motivation right now because it's eight weeks into the semester. Um, I have a feeling that recent events are probably actually making you quite motivated to um, possibly listen to these. I know that for me, uh, getting some work done and recording these lectures for you is helping me regain a sense of focus and a little bit of purpose. So let's spend some time and talk a little bit about motivation. So here's kind of an overview uh, about what we're going to be talking about uh, this week. So we're going to talk about organizational psychology. So we spent the first uh, eight weeks or so uh, focusing on industrial psychology. We are now moving into uh, organizational psychology. And I'll briefly take some time to discuss exactly what organizational psychology is and how it kind of compares and contrasts to industrial psychology. Uh, we'll talk about what motivation is, and we'll also talk about the major theories of motivation and the workplace. For those of you that have had Dr. Teets's motivation and emotion, this is some of this is going to sound very, very familiar, um, but some of these theories might be new as well. And we'll finally talk about how we can use things like motivation, goal setting, things like that uh, to the workplace to make people uh, happier, to make them more motivated, and to make them be productive. So let's start by talking about what organizational psychology actually is and how does it compare to industrial psychology. Now, whereas before we were talking about industrial psychology, so aspects related to things like job processes, so selection, things like hiring, things like assessment, developing criteria, performing a job analysis, uh, we spent a lot of time talking about aspects related to the job itself, and now we're actually going to be spending some time focusing on the relational aspects. And I would argue that for most of us, um, um, this is probably going to be the more interesting part of the class uh, just because um, I can tell you and I have a feeling based on some of your experiences that the jobs that you really like, you probably liked them in some aspect because you liked the people that you worked with. For jobs that you really didn't like, um, I have a feeling that that was likely because of the people that surrounded you. So we're going to start talking about how we relate to each other in the workplace and how this really drives us. So whereas industrial psychology is about selection, hiring, assessment, criteria, um, now we're talking about the different situational, so environmental, and dispositional variables, both yours and those of your coworkers, those of your bosses and subordinates, uh, we're going to talk about these different variables that influence people. So we're going to start by talking about motivation, but this will also cover things like uh, job satisfaction, whether or not you actually like your job. Uh, we're going to talk about how that relates to stress, different aspects related to group dynamics, and more. 
So what does motivation actually have to do with all of this? So I want you to go back to the very like first and second week of the semester, um, those ancient days where we actually met in a classroom. And I want you to think back to what those findings actually told us. So take a minute if you can, and try to remember what the Hawthorne studies were and what the major findings of those particular studies were. So I'll give you a few seconds to kind of jog your memory here. Um, we've been through a lot of changes. Your memory might be a little fuzzy, um, and that is okay. So just take some time to try to think about it. Okay. So the Hawthorne studies, remember that this was uh, done by the... Um, this was done to look at the effect of lighting on productivity. So that was that study with like the big 70 foot candles. Um, and those findings told us that really when people pay attention to you, um, that actually enhances your productivity. When you feel like somebody's listening to you, when you feel like somebody's interested in you and actually cares about you, that can be a very powerful motivating por force. And it turns out that motivation, whether external or internal, does have a pretty powerful effect on job performance. And interestingly enough, your textbook notes that more journal space is actually devoted to work motivation compared to any other topic out there. So motivation is really important. We want people to do a good job. So how can we actually motivate people to do the job that they need to do? Um, and also, your managers and employers also think that motivation is important too. Uh, I would say as a professor, one of the things that I know that we're always concerned about is how motivated you are. Um, sometimes um, it's not that uncommon to hear complaints about the students just don't have any motivation. Um, not for me. I don't really do that. But... Um, it, it's not that uncommon to go to like professor reddits or things like that. Yes, those actually exist. Um, and talk about how somebody's so great because they're motivated or you're really frustrated because these people aren't motivated. And but here's something that we have to keep in mind when we talk about motivation. Now, usually we'll gauge motivation with a test. But the thing is, is that a test doesn't always do a very good job um, indexing one's actual motivation. Now, first of all, you can't just have one test actually just look at motivation. Um, obviously, the more measures that we have that are looking at this, the more we can have that converging validity that we like. So multiple tests and multiple measures are critical. We have to consider multiple ways of indexing motivation with the tests that we use, with the surveys we use, with the questions we ask, and so on. But it's only accounting for a very small amount of variance in performance. So these tests only really uh, explain about 30% of the differences in performance from person to person. So why does somebody do a good job at work? Why does somebody do a bad job at work? The performance on these tests um, really only explains about 30% of the variability, which isn't bad. Like, this is a psychology study. 30% is actually pretty solid. However, I would think that we would probably want a greater amount of variability and a greater amount of understanding for how this affects performance. Um, and so this is really important. Motivation is important, but it's not the only factor that will um, predict how you do on the job. You could be the most motivated person on earth, but if you don't have the cognitive abilities to understand how to do this job effectively, motivation's only going to take you so far. Likewise, if you're not motivated, that may not necessarily mean that you're always going to do a bad job. So motivation's important. It's not the only thing that affects job performance. Job satisfaction perfect, uh, predicts performance. The external environment predicts performance. So it's not the only thing that we need. So what is motivation? 
Let's start with a very, very general definition of what motivation is. So motivation is often described as a force that drives people to behave in a way that either energizes, directs, and or sustains their work behavior. So that's a pretty complicated definition. So let's take some time to break this down. So what do we mean by energizes? We mean that you actually have to expend some effort. So this is not something that is necessarily easy to do. It's something you have to expend effort on. So it directs. That means it helps prod that effort or it helps prod that behavior. And it sustains. It has to enable somebody to hold this for a particular period of time. And so that's a very good way of thinking about motivation. Now, let's be very clear. Motivation, like many other psychological concepts, is a theoretical construct. Now, you can't actually see motivation itself. It's not something that we can sense. We can tell when somebody's motivated by their external behavior, but that does not mean that we are actually seeing motivation. Um, it's not something we can sense, and it's not something that we can directly measure. We have to infer it through behavior, or we have to use measures like surveys, questionnaires, and tests to help us figure that out. So we can operationalize motivation in a few different ways. We can uh, operationalize it by looking at motivation in terms of behavior choice. So what kind of choices would somebody who is motivated make? What kind of choices would somebody who is not motivated make? We can look at the intensity of performance. So we would say that somebody's motivated when they engage in, in, more, in more intense performance than they normally otherwise would. And we can also measure persistence. How often do they engage in a particular behavior? Is it persistent? Now, let's be really clear. Motivation is not the same thing as performance. Um, so one of the things that is often common with managers, and I would say that this is common for anybody that's in charge of somebody else, um, even as a professor, I think that sometimes we lose sight of the fact that performance is not the same thing as motivation. So oftentimes it's very, very easy to assume that if we have a performance problem, that it is solely because of a motivational issue. So if somebody's not doing well at work, oh, it's because they're lazy, they're unmotivated. Um, if we have um, a student not doing well in class, it's because they're clearly lazy. They're not motivated. They're not expending an effort. And as I kind of mentioned, motivation is definitely one predictor of performance but it's not the only thing we need. So motivation is actually what we would consider an antecedent of performance. Motivation is what allows that performance to be. It is a precursor to performance. And there are a lot of other antecedents out there that will affect how well or how poorly you perform. That includes things like your cognitive abilities, like I mentioned. That includes things like your organizational supports. Um, so if you don't have a lot of support on the job, it doesn't matter how motivated you are. If you don't have a lot of support on the job, you may not be able to perform as well as you could have. So motivation may be one possible explanation for poor performance, but it's not the only thing, and it's certainly not the whole story. So I would encourage you, especially when you're on the job or when you're dealing with coworkers and colleagues, if you see poor performance and you're tempted to think that it's laziness, be aware aware that you do not necessarily know the entire story. So we can't just assume that poor performance is due to low motivation. So now let's spend some time uh, talking about the different theories of motivation and how they kind of work. 
So which ones are we going to cover? I'm going to pick some of the ones, some of these are discussed in your textbook, some of these are not, but we're largely going to focus on ones from three major classes. So we're going to have what are known as need motive value theories. We have what are known as cognitive choice theories, which you hear the word cognitive, of course, those are Dr. G's favorites, and then the self-regulation theories. So I want to be clear um, when we talk about this as well. Um, so interestingly enough, um, at just as motivation does not predict good job performance, things like job satisfaction as well because job satisfaction might play a role with some of these things, but job satisfaction does not always mean good performance. And it turns out that the relationship between motivation and performance is more complex than this. So it's really, really tempting to think that motivation works like this. You're highly motivated, it makes you like your job, and you perform well. It's much, much more complicated than this. Liking your job doesn't necessarily mean you do a good job at it. Likewise, being highly motivated does not necessarily mean that you will like your job or that you'll be good at it or that you'll be good at it. So there's a very complex relationship between motivation and performance. And as we'll see next week, there's a very complex relationship with job satisfaction and job performance as well. So we're going to start by talking about these need motive value theories. So we're going to talk about four different types. So we're going to talk about that old, that old favorite of any general psychology class, uh, Maslow's Hierarchy of Human Needs, um, because I am sure that you have heard of Maslow's Hierarchy quite a bit already. I'm going to probably keep the coverage of that one pretty brief. We're going to talk about Alderfer's um, Existence Relatedness Growth Theory. We're going to talk about Hertzberg's two-factor theory, which is probably my favorite. And we're going to talk about job characteristics theory. So what aspects of a job lead to greater motivation as well as greater job satisfaction and thus possibly better performance? Now, what do all of these theories have in common? So why do we call these need motive value theories. All of these emphasize uh, a few different things. So they emphasize things like personality traits, stable dispositions, which are kind of like personality traits, but a little bit different. Where So stable dispositions include things like cognitive ability and things like that. Uh, needs and personal values. And what's interesting is that at least according to these theories, you have to have all of these things in some amount to create motivation. So motivation is a product of your personality traits, your stable dispositions like cognitive ability, um, your needs, and what you value. Um, generally, the best known theories in these groups um, are largely focused on need, um, which we sometimes refer to as need-based theories like Maslow's hierarchy. And typically what we will find is that when we focus on needs, the idea here is that there is something that's driving you, this need is driving you, and if you can reduce that force to get to uh, a sense of equilibrium, um, typically you'll engage in behaviors that reduce those needs so that you can be at this state of homeostasis. So we're going to start by talking about Maslow's hierarchy, and odds are pretty good. I'll probably finish up the video uh, once I'm done talking about this, and I'll move on to the next one. So the basics of Maslow's hierarchy of needs is basically that all human beings are basically aroused, and by aroused we mean energized, um, by both biological and instinctive needs. And the idea here is that you do different behaviors to satisfy those needs. So those needs create these drives that you have to meet. And if you can meet those, at that point, you can focus on more higher level needs. So generally, the hierarchy is structured in such a way that the more basic needs are at the bottom of the hierarchy, like your physiological needs, getting food, getting water. Next are safety needs, things like uh, having a need for shelter, um, being in a country that is not necessarily uh, war-torn or dealing with famine or things like that. I have a feeling right now a lot of us feel like 
our safety needs are being a little bit threatened right now. Um, and then you have these upper levels of the hierarchy which are also important, but you can't meet those until your more basic needs are met. So the hierarchy usually starts with your physiological needs on bottom, safety immediately above that, belongingness and love needs, self-esteem needs, and then self-actualization at the top. And the idea is, is that if you can't meet those basic lower level physiological needs, you're not going to be able to focus on those higher level needs. And we'll talk about this more in a second.